Well, hey, good morning. I'm glad you're here. Uh, For those of you who maybe this is your second time here, because last time was last Sunday for Easter, I just want to say welcome. Uh, Hopefully what you'll find is what's happening at Connection Point is just what's happening at Connection Point. Uh, We try not to fluff it up too much or add too much sparkle. It's just this is, we're just a bunch of people who are flawed trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus. And we're doing that together. And I think that matters. So uh, what I want to do is I want to jump in today to a brand new series. Uh, It's a brand new series on the book of Colossians and then Philemon. We're actually going to cover two books of the Bible in one series. And we're calling it The Resurrected Life. And uh, really the reason why we're calling it that is it has something to do with what I said at the end of my Easter Sunday message when I said the words, because of Jesus' resurrection, we have a resurrection. Like, so Jesus died for us and was raised from the dead three days later, which made him human enough to die, but still God in his power and death could not hold him. And it's because of those things that we actually can live this human life, but turn it over to God, and we don't die either. We're resurrected just like Jesus was. Now, we don't have the power to do that ourselves because we are not God. But because we turn our lives over to him, there's something more in store for us. So what I want to do is for the next few weeks, between now and the first week of June, heaven forbid we carry a sermon series into the summer, right? Between now and the first week of June, what I want to do is I want to just explore with you what it looks like for us on this side of eternity to live resurrected lives. For us to embrace the death and resurrection of Jesus And I think the best way to do that is for us to remember that Jesus died for everyone, didn't he? So he died for you. He died for me. He died for the Gentiles who were not Jewish. He died for the Jews. But he didn't just die for the Jews. He died for the Pharisees who killed him. He died for the people who yelled, crucify him. And then he died for the people who put the whole thing together to make sure he got crucified. He died for those who put a crown of thorns on his head. And he died for those who hoped he would stay dead. If he died for the Pharisee who killed him, that should give us hope that he died for us. So let's talk about one of those Pharisees, a man named Paul, who actually, when he was a Pharisee, his name was Saul. That's how everyone knew him. They knew him as Saul, the Pharisee. He was a man who who grew up uh, in, in a portion of the Roman Empire, not in Jerusalem, but eventually made his way down into Jerusalem to study with some of the most amazing, deep theological Pharisees. And he learned what the law said and what the law didn't say in the eyes of a Pharisee. He learned about these people who were part of something called the way, who were followers of Jesus, who were taking what he had learned and trying to do it different. Well, Paul, Paul, who was Saul, could not have any of that. In fact, we know that at the very first persecution that resulted in death of a Christian, of a man named Stephen. Paul, the Pharisee, held everyone's coats so that they could have the freedom to move their arms to stone this man. He was there. And in fact, he got special permission from the high priest to go throughout the land, find people who were part of this weird Jesus thing, And have them arrested, maybe even killed. Jesus died for Saul, the Pharisee. The one who's trying to snuff out all of this. And in the midst of that journey, 
this man Saul, has an encounter with Jesus. Yeah, the one who's already been resurrected and gone back to heaven, has an encounter with him on the road where he loses his sight. Jesus has now made him blind. And he doesn't know what to do next but to continue to travel into a city and find a man named Ananias who is, who is supposed to help him be healed. And when he finds this man, he gives his life to Jesus and his blindness is removed. It says it fell like scales from his eyes. And as quickly as he could, he started to tell others that Jesus was the way. That everything he had learned his whole life is now different. And he got baptized as quickly as he could. And he's ready to go. Well, a few years later, Paul begins a missionary journey out of Antioch where he travels to different places throughout the Gentile land telling them about Jesus. And then he comes back and he tells everyone at Antioch what he had done and they pray over him and, and they congratulate him. And then eventually he makes a second missionary journey and he, he goes even further and he goes to Macedonia and he heads down into Greece and he's telling people about Jesus and, and the movement is continuing to grow because of people like Paul. And then he goes on his third missionary journey. And that missionary journey ends all the way down in Jerusalem. Where all of his friends, all of his Pharisee friends, no longer like him. And through a series of conversations and debates, they have him arrested. And they try to plot to have him killed and in the midst of that, Paul does like the smartest thing on the face of the earth. And he goes, uh, excuse me, they want to kill me, but I haven't told you yet, but I'm actually a citizen of Rome. I'm not just a Jew here. I'm a Roman citizen, and I would like to speak to the emperor. And they say, fine. It stops him from being killed. And he ends up on a treacherous boat ride across the sea where the the ship gets wrecked. It's a really cool story at the end of Acts. But he ends up in Rome. And how do we know all this? Because we know the narrative of what happened from the book of Acts. So before we even jump in to Colossians, let's look at Acts 28, verses 30 and 31. This is what it says. For two whole years, Paul stayed there. He's talking about in Rome. Paul stayed there in his rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So basically, Paul's in Rome. He's been put on house arrest. He's hanging out in a home where people have access to him, but he's still under arrest. And he begins to continually preach the bold message of the good news that we call the gospel from his house. And while he's there, he starts writing letters to churches that he's visited and churches that he's heard about. And he's writing these letters in about 60 AD. So Jesus has been gone now for about 20 years, 25 years. And now we've, we're in this spot where uh, he's in this prison. He wants to encourage the churches that have been created. And he writes a series of four letters during that two-year window that it, that's discussed in the book of Acts, and we call them prison epistles. Epistle is a fancy word for letter. So the next time you want to send a letter to someone, text them ahead of time and say, I just sent you my epistle, and they'll think you're super official, right? So he wrote these prison epistles, and, and here are the four prison epistles. You have Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. These are the four letters that we know with a lot of certainty during that two-year window where Paul was in Rome under house arrest, he wrote, okay? He wrote a letter to Philippians, and that letter is something we talked about back in October in our series called Everyday Disciple. Remember, we went through the book of Philippians. We could do that over and over again and probably find something different every time. Uh, but we went through the book of Philippians 
And we talked about that. And, and he wrote that letter as a thank you letter to the church in a place called Philippi for the gifts that they had sent him. And he wrote a letter to the Ephesians, a place where in Paul's missionary journey, he had actually stayed there for two or three years. And he writes a letter to them to encourage them and to, to tell them to take this letter and to share it with others. And he writes a letter we call Colossians that we're going to study starting today. And he writes a letter to an individual named Philemon. And this is important because Philemon is actually a member of the Colossian church. And he wrote him a letter to share something important with him. Well, well, how did he know to write a letter to the church in, in Colossians? Like, how did he know that? Well, he met a man named Epaphras. And Epaphras or Epaphras, however you want to say it, none of us are Greek scholars, right? Um, Epaphras is someone who actually started the church, the Colossian church. And Paul had never actually even been there. Paul didn't start this church. Epaphras had, had learned about Jesus probably through one of other Paul's missionaries' journeys in the area. And, and he starts this church and he comes to Paul in Rome to tell him about it. And Paul writes this letter back to the Colossian church because he had heard from Epaphras how they were doing. All the good and not so good. Can you imagine a church having pieces of it that are not so good? Isn't that awful? I could make you a list, right? Because we're human. So um, Paul is writing this letter back to the Colossian church, and, and he calls a couple people to help him, a man named Tychicus and a man named Onesimus. And these are important names, actually, even though you won't find them very often in Scripture. So Tychicus is the one who's carrying this letter. He's the one who's carrying this letter. And Tychicus, we believe, and this is something that's debated, but I think it's something that's probably true. Tychicus carried the letter to Colossae, to the book of Colossians. He carried the letter to the Ephesians because they were close together. And he carried the letter to the person Philemon. I mean, Tychicus carried all three on this journey. Could you imagine three of the letters that are in our Bible were carried by some dude who we don't even know to some place that we don't understand and somehow we look at these things as Holy Scripture. Isn't that crazy when you stop and think about it? So Tychicus is going and he says, take Onesimus with you. Well, Onesimus is an interesting character. Onesimus is a man who's actually a runaway slave who found Jesus, not the man who found Jesus in his heart through the, through the story and the message of the gospel and fell madly in love with his faith. His life was changed. Here's the problem. The slave owner he ran away from was Philemon. And Paul is saying to Tychicus and to Onesimus, you got to go back. Tychicus carry the letters. Onesimus, go see your slave owner, Philemon. Because here's the deal. Philemon is a believer too. And I want him to know about you. So these two men start their journey together from Rome all the way to Turkey. <laughs> They're traveling together. It probably took them on foot if they didn't take a day off, it probably took them on foot about six to eight days of just walking every day to get to Ephesians, to get to Ephesus, to drop off that letter, then another two days to get to Colossae. Tychicus and Onesimus are the deliverers of two of the letters that are in our Holy Scripture. And I don't think they get enough gratitude for that. We just read it and call it the Bible. So, we are in Colossae. It is a city that's in modern-day Turkey now. Uh, there's a river that runs right next to it. It's called the Lycus River. And, Ty and uh, Col Colossae is part of the Lycus River Valley, kind of like the Miami Valley, right? It's part of the, the Lycus River Valley. And in there includes a city called Hi Hierapolis, another city called Laodicea, and, and Colossae. Those are the three main cities in this area. Uh, Hierop Hierapolis and Laodicea 
uh, will come up in different parts of Scripture. Laodicea is actually really important. There's a really important letter to them that's written in Revelation. So uh, Laodicea, Hierapolis, Colossae, they're all kind of in the same area in modern-day Turkey. And there's a church there that Paul has never visited that he's writing his first letter to. And this letter to Colossians is kind of broken down into two pieces because it's only four chapters. Uh, the first two chapters of Colossians focused on, are a focus on Christ the Messiah and King. And if you were a part of our gospel series of Mark, Mark was talked a lot about Jesus is the Messiah. That was the big part of, of what he was talking about. And now here we are again in a different form, not in the form of a story, but in the form of a letter. We're once again focusing on Christ the Messiah and King. And the third and fourth chapters are about what it means to live as resurrected. So when we talk about the resurrected life, chapters three and four are kind of narrow us in on what it looks like for you and I now to live as resurrected people in Christ. That's the plan. So this is how letters in the first century work. Someone carries the letter into the city, they get the church together, Tychicus would have brought them all together, and he would have said, I have a letter from Paul. And they all would have stopped, they would have gathered around him, and Tychicus would have read the letter out loud to them. They wouldn't have passed it around, it wouldn't have been forwarded by email, it would have been a, a written letter in front of the church telling them what Paul has to, to share. So let me give you just a little nugget of information that may be helpful to you as you study Scripture. Whenever you are studying a letter in the Bible, an epistle, one of Paul's or Peter's or any of the other ones in the New Testament, when you're studying a letter, read the whole letter first once, then go back and study it. Because it's a letter, like a real letter. Not like a Bible letter, like we just call it a letter. I'm like, church, listen. Listen. Like, this is a real letter, okay? It doesn't have a stamp, no envelope, but it's a real letter, and it's supposed to be read like a letter. Are you telling me that the book of Romans, which has so many chapters, I'm supposed to read it like a letter? Yes, I am. Then go back and study it, because the Bible's not meant to be just read. It's meant to be studied, right? Okay. Okay. So, Tychicus is now in the city with Onesimus. They're standing before the people, and they're getting ready to share the letter that has been written. Colossians 1.1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. Okay? When we write letters, at the end of the letter, we tell them who we are. What you'll find in Scripture is that in the, first, in the first century, when they write letters, they start with who they are. So this letter doesn't say, dear Colossians. It says, Paul, by the will of God, with his brother Timothy. Timothy was a follower of Paul who on <clears throat> his second missionary journey, he met a young man. Paul didn't have children. Timothy is the closest thing Paul has to a son. I mean, he is helping him grow. They're together in Rome while Paul is writing this letter. Now, when we say Paul is writing this letter, we don't know if there was someone else writing it and Paul was speaking it. We don't know if Timothy was writing it and Paul was speaking it. But these are Paul's words to the church. Verse 2, to God's holy people in Colossae, that's who it's written to, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. So he's tearing down all the walls. Hey, I know you're one of us. You're a brother and a sister in Christ. We know that you're part of the family. And I, I'm sending nothing but grace and peace to you on behalf of the Lord. He goes on to say this. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all of God's people. Now, we say this all the time, right? If I said to you, um, I'm having surgery tomorrow. And you all got a chance to talk to me individually today right after church. I'm not having surgery tomorrow, by the way. <clears throat> but if I said I was, you would all say the same thing to me. I'm praying for you. And about 40% of you actually would. 
And listen, I'm not trying to be difficult because I do the same thing sometimes. I have to be careful. It has become uh, an important part of my discipline that if I say I'm praying for someone, I actually do it. But for many years, and if we're all being honest, we've all done this, where we have actually used the phrase, I'm praying for you, but we don't actually mean it. What we mean is I'm thinking about you, and we want to just spiritualize it a little bit. Or someone asks you to do something, and you know the answer is no, and you say, well, let me pray about it and get back with you. When you already know, you're going to say no. I'm not saying none of you pray. What I'm saying is, is we all do that sometimes. I want you to understand that this is not what Paul is doing. Paul is not saying, we always thank God for you when we pray for you because we've heard of you. He's not saying, oh, I'm just, it's fancy, nice letter, I pray for you. Whether I actually do or not, it's debatable, but, but uh, I pray for you. I think it's important for us to remember that this man, Paul, does not have a home church like Connection Point. He doesn't have a certain place where he goes every Sunday to do church. In fact, that's not even a thing yet. When he talks about the church, he's talking about the body of Christ. He's talking about the actual people of the church, not the building of the church. So when he calls them brothers and sisters, he means it. And when he says, I'm praying for you, it's not some kind of fancy way to say hi. He actually is praying for them because his view of the church is the view that we are supposed to have, which is we are the church. Not the building, not just this group of people. We are the church. We are an expression inside of this building of something that's much bigger than us. See, whether this is your home church or you go to another church that loves Jesus very much and you just happen to be here this Sunday, I want you to know that whether you're there or here, we are part of the same church. There is no membership, no calling card here that somehow you get closer to God by coming to 1510 Campbell. All right? There is nothing about this place that makes us any more holy or any more special than any other church that is elevating the word of God and teaching you about Jesus. And that is what Paul understood and we struggle to understand. You know, when my daughter was about three, she's 12 now, right? You're 12? Yeah. <clears throat> when my daughter was about three, she couldn't say her R's very well, okay? And um, I used to love it because she, she still to this day loves to come to church early with me. And usually I don't let her because I'm here so, so early. Um, but she used to say to me when she wanted to go to church, she wouldn't call it church. And I don't know why, but she used to say, Daddy, can we go to the church house? Daddy, I want to go to the church house. And I thought it was so cute, but over, I mean, she called it that probably from the age of three to the age of five or six. Daddy, are we going to the church house today? And the more she said it, the less cute it was and the more convicting it was. That my daughter, whether she realized it or not, had better theology than her father. This is just the church house. We are the church. Paul got it. The reason he got it is because there was no church house other than people's houses. I'm so grateful that we have this place. But don't be confused. It's not about this place. We are the church. Paul got it. So when Paul says, I'm praying for you, my brothers and sisters, he's saying something completely different than what we say. Are you with me? All right, we're only two verses in. <laughs> Don't know what your lunch plans are. Just kidding. Colossians 5, uh, 1, verses 5 and 6, it says this, The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up in you in heaven. 
and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. He's saying, listen, you're already moving forward. I'm praying for you, and I want you to understand that there's a true hope that's coming up, the faith and love, because you've already heard the true message of the gospel. What is the true message of the gospel? Christ died. Christ rose from the dead. Christ is coming back. That's about as bare bones as it gets. Now, now could we weave into that and have a whole lot more to say about that? Absolutely, absolutely. But the true message of the gospel is that God loved us so much that he sent himself to earth to be the human representative for us because we are terrible at keeping our end of a covenant with God. And he killed him on behalf of us so that our sins could be forgiven. But death couldn't hold him because he's God. And he rose back to the Father after 500 people saw him. And there he waits for a second coming where he doesn't come like a baby. He comes in power and the authority of the one true God. That's the gospel. And what he's saying to them is, you guys understand the true message of the gospel. The gospel meaning good news, right? Which means the idea that Jesus died and rose from the dead is newsworthy. It actually matters. And his coming back will be even more newsworthy because it's good news because it's the gospel. Are you with me? All right. And then he says this in in, uh, the end of verse 6. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit. Everybody say bearing fruit. And growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been done, I'm sorry, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. So there's this moment. Let's go all the way back to the beginning of time. There's this moment with Adam and Eve, and they're chilling in the garden with God. And God says, you get authority. I'm giving you authority. And here's what I want you to do. Here's how I'm blessing you. Be fruitful and multiply. Well, we hear that and we think of bunny rabbits, right? We hear that and we think about populating the earth with humans. Listen, it is so much bigger than that. God is calling Adam and Eve to be human representatives of himself so that the world will know that he is the one true God. And he's asking Adam and Eve to be fruitful, to grow, to flourish in the land, and to multiply. Not just create more humans, create more humans who understand who God is. Well, let's fast forward 2,000 years, and now here we go. Jesus died to keep the covenant that we couldn't keep. And now what Paul is saying to this brand new church in Colossae, What he is saying to them is the gospel is bearing fruit. The blessing of God is still here. The gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the world. The gospel is being fruitful and multiplying. Because that's what God's blessing looks like. So the gospel is bearing fruit and multiplying throughout the whole world. It's been doing that among you, and now it's doing it among others. Since the day you heard, it's been happening among you, but we want you to know it's happening everywhere. Because that's what the gospel does. What does it take to be fruitful? Well, when it comes to Middle Eastern, first century fruit trees, what it takes to be fruitful is healthy roots, being properly fed, and lots of light. Lots of light. Now, Pastor Tim, are there fruit trees that don't need quite as much light? Of course. But in the middle of a desert climate, they all need light. Okay? Grow deep roots. Be fed well. Not overfed. Not just sitting around being fed all the time. Being properly fed and plenty of light. A 
Colossians 1.9, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding the Spirit gives. There's a, it's really important. There's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. Are you with me? Knowledge and wisdom are not the same thing. See, knowledge is how much you know. It's what you've got in here. And we gain knowledge through reading Scripture We gain knowledge through prayer. We gain knowledge through studying with other people. Knowledge is a wonderful thing, but it's meaningless without wisdom. Completely meaningless. Wisdom is what you do with your knowledge. You ever known super smart people who are the dumbest people you've ever met? I'm serious. You know what I'm talking about? You know those kind of people? The ones who are like, how are you so brilliant and so dumb at the exact same time? They got knowledge and they got wisdom. I think knowledge combined with foolishness is about the most dangerous combination in the world. If you're not smart and you're foolish, I get it. But when you're super smart and foolish, you're dangerous. You know what I mean? He's hoping that they're filled with knowledge, but that knowledge will interact through wisdom and understanding that only the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives. He's continually talking about praying for them. We have not stopped praying for you because Paul was focused on the entire body. His prayers were lifted for the entire body. You see that? Paul is not just praying for Ephesus because he was there for a couple years. He's praying for the entire body because he sees the church as the entire body. Man, if I could see it the way Paul sees it. If we were a church who understood that we were not the entire body, things would get different, I think. I mean, think about it. Imagine if we said things like, well, that church has a really good blank program, so why would we recreate that? We'll just send our people there for that. And the other church is going, well, they're really good at this. Why don't we send them here for that? But instead, we all recreate the same things, don't we? Because we build our own little empires instead of being the entire body, the way God is calling us to. just to make you a little uncomfortable. In verse 10, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, colon. You see that? There's a colon there. That you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, colon. See how I highlighted the colon? Can you see that? It's yellow because I don't want you to miss it. Because what that means is whatever is coming next is super important. This is what it means to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord in every way. So what does it say? Let's keep going. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, not according to our might, according to the might of God, so that you may have great endurance and patience. Everybody say endurance and patience. The two hardest things to live with. There are very few patient people in 2022. And there are very few people who have the endurance to do hard things first to get their returns later. Am I right? Everybody wants a shortcut. So if we want to be living a way that's, that's pleasing to the Lord, we should be bearing fruit like the gospel bears fruit, right? We're bearing fruit in every good work. We're growing in our knowledge, and what's implied is that we're growing in our wisdom. We're not just getting smarter. 
we're being more wise, and we're being strengthened because we're tapping into the power of God, not into our own power. So that we can have endurance and patience. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of holy people in the kingdom of light. And we, we give God thanks for allowing us to be a part of the kingdom of light. Did you miss it? How do we bear fruit? We grow deep roots. Our roots are well cared for. We're fed properly and we get plenty of light. And what does God provide for us? The opportunity to grow deeper. The opportunity to be properly fed. And light. Because he is leading a kingdom of light. Because the gospel bears fruit, we are called to bear fruit. Because the gospel is already fruitful and that's what the blessing of God looks like, we are called to bear fruit because we are the caretakers and the deliverers of the gospel message. Our lives should bear fruit fruit. And he is our light. He is our source of food. Amen. He is our light. So I want you to hear that the resurrected life is marked by a dependence on God to provide us with all we need to bear fruit. Okay. So before we get too far into the series, I want you to understand that Part of living a resurrected life is becoming dependent on God to give you all you need to bear fruit in this world. I've come across many people in my life who've said no to faith because they came across someone who said they were a Christian and they didn't see the fruit, right? If I walk up to a dead tree, why would I want to be a dead tree? We're called to bear fruit, but in order to do that, even to understand what that means, we have to give our dependence completely to God and trust that he is our food, he is our light. Why should we trust him? Why should we be dependent on him? Well, Paul goes on to tell us in verses 13 and 14, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Remember, he's given us the kingdom of light. So now we have a juxtaposition here between the kingdom of light and the dominion of darkness. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, meaning the forgiveness of sins. It is the forgiveness of our sins that makes us whole. It's the forgiveness of our sins that allows us to no longer be in the dominion of darkness. It's the forgiveness of our sins that is our resurrection. Are you with me? Because our sins are forgiven, we can go from death to life like Jesus did. So I got some questions for you. Here's my first question. When is the last time I asked God to forgive my sin? See, we're super good at the church of being like, if you want to follow Jesus, you just ask God to forgive your sins and, and tell him that, he died on, that you know he died for you and, and that he rose from the grave and now you're part of the family of God. That's a great first step. but I have not come across anyone in Sydney, Ohio yet that has caused me to think that they are sinless. Have you? Have you come across anyone, even in the mirror, that you look at and you think to yourself, you know what? 
I haven't sinned in like five years. I am so good at this. Sin. Right there. Pride. When's the last time you asked God to forgive your sins? When's the last time you stopped and just said, Lord, would you forgive me? I mean, Jesus taught his disciples to pray that way. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, right? Part of doing this whole Jesus thing is recognizing our need for him. So when is the last time that you stopped individually from elder and pastor all the way down to brand new baby Christian? When is the last time that you stopped and said, I think it's been a while since God and I had that kind of talk. See, they're already forgiven. But there's a beauty in saying, God, would you forgive them? When is the last time that you asked for your sins to be forgiven? My second question is this. When is the last time that I thanked God for, forg for forgiving my sin? When is the last time? Let's say, oh, Pastor Tim, that's part of my life. When is the last time that you said, Lord, thank you for loving me enough to forgive my sin. These questions are up here because they're questions for me, not for you, by the way. These are things I struggle with. I struggle to stop and ask the Lord to forgive me of my sins. I struggle to thank him when he has forgiven my sins and he's brought me into this new life. I struggle sometimes to do that. So what I'm asking of you, I want you to know that I'm also asking of myself. When's the last time you thanked God, or I thanked God, for the gift of redemption, the forgiveness of sins? Three, can anyone tell I'm a believer in Jesus by the way I treat others? Can anyone tell that there's something different about me? Can anyone tell that because I didn't get what I deserve, which is hell, that I treat others in a way that maybe they don't deserve. Are there people that see the way I interact with them and they say to, your, say to themselves, why does he extend so much grace? Why is he nice to me even when I'm not nice to him? Do people see in me or in you the Jesus we serve by the way we treat others or are we too concerned with what's fair? Well, it's not fair. They shouldn't have said that. They shouldn't have acted that way. I shouldn't be treated that way. Boy, oh boy, I'm so glad that Jesus was unfair. I am so glad that he didn't give people what they deserve because we wouldn't be here. Can people tell, not by how nice I am, but by how unfairly kind and loving I am, that I serve the risen Savior? And four, is my life marked by my dependence on God? Is my life marked by my dependence on God? What do you mean by that, Pastor Tim? Um, how are your finances? How are they going? Are you running the number a thousand times, trying to figure out how to make it work, but not once presenting all of it to the Lord? How's your job? How's it going? Is there a part of you that feels like maybe you should be doing something else, but you have yet to even have that conversation with Jesus? See, when your life is marked by dependence on God, it is no longer about what we want or how we want the world to function. It is about what he's asking of us as people. That's why some of the most generous people on the, in the entire world have the least amount of money. That is why some of the people who uh, should be focused on how do I make life work seem so peaceful because they know God is in control and as long as they follow the steps he's asking of them through his word, through the encouragement of others, and through prayer, everything's going to be okay. See, we like, we like the Jesus part, the, the church part of all this. But on a day-to-day -day basis, 
Is your life marked by dependence on God? Now, for the foolish people in the room, I'm not pointing fingers, but for the foolish people in the room, I did not just tell you to go jump off a cliff and see if God saves you. That's foolish. I didn't tell you to go quit your job and sit in a a, a recliner and wait for God to send money in the mail. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about is, is your life fully dependent on God that you know you are where he's called you to be, you're doing the things he's called you to do, and if you don't know how to figure all of that out, that's part of how we grow. And as you bear more fruit and you grow deeper, those things become more evident to you. Is your life marked by a dependence on God? Or if someone looked at your life, would they just see that you're independent? That's usually a positive thing, but I just used it as a negative. Did you hear it? Independence, when it comes to our faith, is a bad thing. We are called to live dependent. The beautiful piece of that is the one that we're dependent on is the creator of all of us anyway. He's better at it than we are. So what do I do? I'm going to call the worship team on back up. Uh, But what, what do I do now? Okay, I want to make some first steps at the beginning of this new series on how I can live a more resurrected life. What do I do now? Well, the first thing I'm going to do uh, that I'd like you to do is I'd like you to start praying, which sounds like such a wonderful pastoral thing to say. But I want you to pray specifically for another church in town. Stop praying for us this week. Okay? Any church in this town that you know of who is preaching the good news, because we are not the only one, I want you to commit the next seven days to praying for them. I want you one day just to sit in their parking lot and pray for them. We've got to start to learn what Paul already knew, and that is we are a portion, not the entire body. And if he prayed for all of them the way he did, it is time for us to pray for the churches in this city the same way. Pick a church, pray for them. If you want to add a second church to your list, not just the church that you know that is sharing the gospel well, pick the church in town that's not. I don't have a list for you. Pick a church in town that you know is struggling to share the gospel. Pray for them too. They need you. They need us. So one, I want you to pray. Two, I want you to read Colossians 1 this week. Now, Pastor Tim, didn't we just cover Colossians 1? No, 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 no. We barely got halfway through the first chapter. What I want you to do is I want you to read Colossians 1, which is what we've already covered, and then we're going to finish Colossians 1 next Sunday. I want you to read it. For those of you who want to read it and talk about it a little bit more after you read it or while you're reading it, there's a group of people who are going to meet on Wednesday nights throughout this series in our adult classroom who are just going to talk. There is no teacher They're just going to sit and they're going to talk about what they're getting from their reading and and ask questions. That's it. So if you want to be a part of that Wednesdays at 7 p.m., there's a group of people that are just going to come in and you're going to talk about Colossians if you want to process that with someone else. But church, if we're going to be who God's called us to be, we have to be students of the word. So I need you to keep reading. So Colossians 1 this week. Are you with me? Here's the bottom line for today. The resurrected life is found in surrendering to a God who will provide all you need because he's just that good. The resurrected life is found in surrendering to God to give you all you need to bear fruit because he's just that good.